Hello people, and welcome to another City Skylines tutorial. Hope you're all having a wonderful day. And today we are back in Palavan, um, which I guess will become our test city now. And today we are going to have a look at the policy options available to us in the game, including services, taxation and city planning. This video is definitely tailored towards those with little to no experience with the game and have no idea how to use the policies. There are new policies added with each of the DLCs, so if you're seeing a policy in my list that isn't in yours, it's because you don't have that relevant DLC. Shameless plug, if you are interested in picking up DLCs, there are links to Instant Gaming below. They do help support the channel, so if you're interested, maybe check out the link below. A lot of them are pretty self-explanatory, so we'll cover all of them as briefly as we can. And also include a couple of examples of before and after shots of exactly how these policies and options available to us actually affect our cities. But anyway... Let's get started, shall we? So, to access our policies, we come down into the bottom right hand corner here, into the little white paper with a green tick on it, and hit policies. And then they're all listed out for us here, and we also have two tabs along the top as well. Again, as I mentioned at the start of the video, these will look vastly different dependent on what DLCs you do and do not have. But we'll work our way down the list and then across the tabs as well today. So, first of all, we have power usage and water usage, and we can band these two together. And each of them has a tooltip as well, so if you hover over them, it does tell you what it does. However, some of them aren't always uh, quite as clear as to what effect they have on the city. So, power usage will moderately reduce the electricity consumption at a cost of $5 or £5 or 5 simoleons, whatever you want to call the currency, per building. So, we have a look at our power at the minute. Palavan is currently consuming 832 megawatts of power. If we activate this policy and then come and check again... We are now consuming 712. So obviously these two policies here, water will work the same as well if we turn this off. Have a look how much water we're consuming. It's currently 894,000. And then we come in and turn this on. We can check it again. And then it drops back down. So these two policies become significantly more expensive, of course, as the city grows because you're going to be paying... Uh, five dollars for every building that's in the city when you would use these is really at the start of the city um, if you're struggling for money and you're not quite ready to place in another power plant or another water tower or another water pump using these can give you a little more breathing room just to take you away from this orange bar for a little bit but once the city grows into a significant size probably around your third or fourth milestone you're not really going to have much use for these policies anymore and you can tend to turn them off um, you can actually end up saving quite a bit of money um, if you do remember to turn them off because if you put them on at the start of the map and then don't turn them off and the city grows to something the size of Palavan, you know, you can imagine $5 for every building, that starts to add up. So that's power and water usage, pretty self-explanatory and more useful at the start of the game. Next up we have smoke detector and distribution which will significantly reduce the risk of fire, again, at a cost of $5 per building in the city. We come into our emergency services. Uh, Palavan currently has a 57% hazard risk of fire breaking out anywhere in the city. Of course, if you're not playing with fire on, this policy is totally useless. Uh, so go into your gameplay settings and actually check if you have fires on. If we activate this policy and come back into our hazard, we will see with the game on 3 speed that the hazard will fall by a couple of percentiles in Palavan, it will drop to about 55. So if you're having severe problems with fires in your city, this can be helpful, otherwise it's not massively useful. Next up we have Pet Ban, um, which will slightly reduce the garbage accumulation with a trade-off of a slightly decreased happiness. Decreasing happiness is never really a good thing to do, you know, you want your sims to be as happy as possible. And the slightly reduced garbage accumulation isn't really a good trade-off for that. Um, if we activate this and leave the game to run on 3 speed for a hot minute, uh, we will just see, you know, these little pointers, they move ever so slightly. There's no real reason to ban pets. Uh, you could apply this to a specific district if you wanted to, but otherwise it, it's kind of pointless. Unless you're having real severe garbage problems and maybe you can't afford to place in another recycling centre or a landfill site, pet ban's fairly useless. Now coming on to recycling, again another garbage uh, accumulation reduction policy. 
a recycling will reduce the garbage accumulation uh, with the trade-off of a slightly reduced tax income. Again, if you're having garbage pilot problems, this can be helpful, uh, maybe in a specific district. If, um, say for example, uh, the Emerald district right here uh, was getting a ton of uh, garbage pile up, I could specifically apply recycling to it. And But you know, you have to bear in mind you're gonna lose tax income as well. Uh, for a city the size of Palavan, money really isn't an issue now. Uh, you know, you kind of, uh, you reach a, a point of terminal velocity or critical mass, I guess, in city skylines eventually where money isn't really a concern anymore. And you will just have millions in the bank. Uh, so, slightly reduced tax income, not great at the start of the game. Certainly not a, a policy you want to be applying early game because you're going to start eating into that income. But late game, if you're having garbage accumulation issues, then recycling can be a useful policy. Next up we have smoking ban, which again is a policy that affects our citizen happiness. So if we apply this, you know, things will shift ever so slightly. And it is a, a slight increase in health uh, with a trade-off of a slight decrease in happiness. So health isn't really a mechanic in city skylines. The way people get sick is really through pollution. And, um, you know, for a city of nearly 90,000 people, only 20 of them are sick. So... You know, at least in my experience with the game, health has never been an issue. You know, people. I mean, maybe this is something that we can, that can be expanded in cities too. The clinics and hospitals are basically parks. They just increase land value and force buildings to level up. There's no real fleshed out gameplay mechanic with The Sims' health um, in city skylines. So again, if you want to slightly decrease your citizens' happiness for a slight boost in health, then apply smoking ban. Next up, we have parks and recreation, which will moderately increase the land value around parks and plazas. Also, increase the parks and plazas budget by 20%. So, if we have a look at our budget and come into the budget tab, I'll look at parks and plazas. Currently spending 30,000 on parks and plazas in Palavan. If we activate this policy, we'll of course see this switch up. Leave the game on 3 speed for a hot second. Then the budget will slowly increase by 20% of what you're initially spending, of course, this 20% will scale if we move this slider up and down. So bear that in mind, this will become considerably more expensive the higher that this bar is. Now if we have a look at our land value, um, even without this policy active, you can see Palavan's land values are all fairly high. We're all pretty much in the green uh, for most places. You know, it's, a, it's a nice place to live. Um, so maybe, again, you could apply this to a specific district with a lot of parks and plazas in. And if you really want to make a, a luxury area, increase the land value, which of course increases happiness and forces buildings to level up. Um, so maybe a policy for a specific district, but your city will survive without it. So unless you're really looking for that incredible boost in land value uh, quite quickly, uh, then... State parks and recreation on, but just bear in mind a 20% increase is quite significant. So just check within your budget tab what you're spending on parks and plazas before you activate this policy. Education boosts will prioritise education over working for young adults so they're more likely to go to university campuses. And it also increases our education budget by 25%. So again, we have a look at our education. Currently spending 54,000. If we activate this policy, and back into our budget tab, leave the game on three speed for a hot second, this number will slowly climb up. Again, it will scale with our sliders here, so just be careful before you activate this policy because you could really start eating into your income. This is a policy that's really useful for getting our campus areas uh, to level up faster. Um, I use this quite a lot in my cities when I'm trying to hit those next education levels. Uh, just to get more students into the campus areas because sometimes it can be a little difficult to get to hit max level uh, the way campuses level up isn't really great but whatever that's <laughs> probably a different subject for a different video uh, and again it's i i've always applied it citywide uh, if you guys have had different experiences applying this to a, a specific district and um, please let me know but i usually use this one just to get campus areas to hit that next level but you know just be careful about that 25 percent increase because that's you know that, that's a quarter of your budget that's a, that's a fairly hefty chunk. So education boost is quite useful. 
Next up we have recreational use, uh, which slightly increases tax income, uh, moderately increased uh, tourism. Uh, that's tourism numbers, not income from tourism. Uh, for a slightly reduced crime rate with a trade-off of a 15% increase to your policing budget. This is usually a good policy to have on city-wide, um, unless you're maybe going for a specific theme of not having recreational use uh, available across your city. Um, again, if you have maybe some nightlife or tourism specialisations in the district, this can be useful to apply to that district. But in my experience, there's never any reason uh, not to apply this policy city-wide. Next up is free public transport. Um, quite a unique policy. Uh, so before you activate this, again, you want to check uh, your income. Have a look what you're making from public transport. Uh, 13,000 currently in Palavan, um, which is fairly low for public transport, to be fair. It should be noted as well that this policy only affects your internal lines. You will still make money from external train lines, taxis and the airports. Uh, so this will only affect, and um, you can kind of see here as we leave this policy on, uh, that we will uh, still be making money uh, from planes, taxis and trains as well. It's only everything else, so buses, trolleybuses, metros, trams, ferries, monorails, cable cars and sightseeing tours will all stop making money. But again, just to reiterate, Planes landing at your airports, external train lines and taxis will all continue to make money with free public transport activated. So you can see now we've activated it, Palavan's income falls through the floor <laughs> because we make money with our public transport. So the only reason you would really apply this is if you're struggling with traffic and you want that increased use of public transportation. Because um, you know public transport keeps cars off the road because people are using the the public transport systems, obviously. I've, I I never use this. <laughs> um, no, public transport is a decent money maker. But if you're having severe traffic issues and you need some kind of alleviation and you want to maybe start introducing some heavier public transport systems, um, like Palavan has with multiple public transport hubs, uh, then go ahead and uh, and check it out. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll have a look at a, a little speed up of Palavan's public transport hubs with and without this policy activated and see if we can notice a difference uh, with how many people are actually coming and going from the transport hub. So you can see from the time-lapse footage and the numbers on the screen that, at least in Palavan, this policy makes very, very tiny amounts of differences to how many people are actually using the public transport network. This policy will have significantly different effects on every one city, depending on how extensive your public transport systems are. At Palavan, as an example, uh, all of our public transport is really highly integrated. There is an absolute ton of it, um, and they all converge with one another. So people just switch from one method to the other. As you can see in our downtown public transport hub here, we have trams, intercity trains, monorails, and metros as well, all meeting up. So if your public transport isn't quite as integrated and converging as something like Palavans is, you may get a little less or more mileage out of this policy depending on your city. So this will vary uh, from player to player quite heavily. Next up, we have schools out, which will force citizens to go to work over education. Higher educated Sims will take uh, better jobs in office spaces and high density commercial and low density commercial as well. If you're having an issue with your worker demands, then this can be a useful policy to apply to a specific district. I would never apply this citywide. Um, you will really nerf your higher education. Um, which earns you more money uh, with people going to higher jobs and buildings leveling up to max level. Uh, they do require uh, higher educated citizens. So, you know, if you're struggling with fulfilling uneducated worker demands, uh, schools out over a specific uh, residential area uh, can be helpful to stop that problem. Next up, we have harsher prison sentences, which will double the usual prison sentence length. 
which will, of course, keep felons off the streets for longer, as the policy specifies. More of a gimmick policy, as opposed to something that really heavily affects the way our cities function. Um, if you're getting a ton of crime uh, in your city, uh, which for some reason isn't being fixed by just placing more police stations, harsher prison sentences can help reduce that figure. But again, not massively impactful. So we're now coming to three snowfall policies of extra insulation, no electricity for heat, and only electricity for heat. So for those playing in the snowfall maps, extra insulation, uh, building require less energy for heating, and um, which will of course affect your uh, heating stat. Of course you have to actually heat your buildings in a snowfall map uh, for every other map in the game. Uh, these policies uh, will have no effect. Uh, you can also tell those buildings uh, to not use uh, electricity for heat, meaning they will only use the heat provided by uh, the heating power plants that you use, which will of course uh, reduce your electricity consumption. And then only electricity for heat will do the opposite of that. Um, they won't use the heat provided by the heating plants. They will use your power plants, which of course will increase your electricity consumption. So it's just trading off one for the other, depending on which of these you activate. Uh, but again, only applies to snowfall maps. Uh, people outside of snowfall don't have to worry about this. Next up, we have helicopter priority, where if this policy is active, if there are emergencies on areas with this policy on, the services will always use helicopters instead of ground vehicles. Again, more of a gimmick policy. Um, unless you're having severe problems with emergencies like fires and stuff, unless you're having severe problems with fire and crime and whatnot, then your police and fire helicopters will make use of this policy. But in my experience, I've never had a need to activate this. It's more of a gimmick. If your road network isn't quite as extensive and it takes a long time uh, for fire trucks and police cars to drive over to where they need to go, helicopter priority might be useful. Again, <laughs> based on my own experience with the game, never really needed it. Uh, if, if anyone else has, again, uh, with all these policies that we're covering today, if you guys have maybe had a different experience with something that I'm talking about, uh, please feel free to drop it in the comments below uh, so myself and others can read it but there's a fair few gimmicky policies uh, within the game, with helicopter priority being one of them. Next up, we have uh, prefer ferries, which will force citizens to prefer ferries uh, for moving around in the city. Again, only applies if you have a fairly extensive and expanded ferry network within your city. Uh, currently, um, Palavan uh, has around 83 people a week uh, using the ferry system. Uh, which is fairly extensive for a ferry network. It flows around the rivers. It comes out from Clawson Wharf, uh, past Dawson through Canalavan, uh, into the Riverfish Co-op, uh, through the downtown where it switches into another separate system, and then there's another ferry system uh, that flows down into the rivers. So it's a fairly extensive ferry network. Only 83 people are using it without this policy. And then if we uh, turn this on, it's at a cost of uh, $2 per ferry in use. So that's uh, the ones on the line. So that's not per line, it's per ferry. So if it's $2 here, it's going to cost us $20 for this specific line right here. So we'll leave this on. And then you can just kind of see it's jumped up to 85 now. 27 tourists a week. You're getting very slight increases. Uh, unless you've got an absolute ton of water in your map and a fairly extensive ferry network, then prefer ferries isn't something you're going to see a vast amount of use out of. But it's nice if you want to bump the ferry numbers a little bit. Next up, we have high ticket prices, which will raise public transport ticket prices by 25% to get more profit. Again, at a trade-off, it says this may result in less passengers. It's not a guaranteed uh, percentile decrease. It's going to be fairly city dependent, again, depending on the extent of your public transport systems, how heavily the citizens rely on that public transport to get around. Then you can you can apply this if you want. So we'll take a look at our budget again without this policy active. We're currently making 17,000. If we come in and turn on this policy, higher ticket prices, pop the game on three speed for a hot minute, we'll see that this figure will slowly climb again. It will depend how extensive your public transport systems are um, as to how much this increases by, because obviously that's going to be dependent on how many sims 
are actually using the public transport. So if you're struggling for money and you want to nerf how many people are using your public transport systems a bit, higher ticket prices might be for you. We'll now move on to the worst policy in the game, <laughs> educational blimps. If you are one of the few people in the world that actually uses blimps in your city, and then you can turn this on, which will switch the advertisements on blimps to be educational posters. Um, to, to be fair, I do use this policy if I'm really struggling for a campus to get to next level. And um, this this can help um, if you want to put educational blimps on. And um, it will just help bump those campuses up a little bit quicker. But of course, you do need to have blimp systems um, within your city. It doesn't cost you anything, so it's never a bad thing unless you want stupid sims. So there's no real downside to having this on, apart from having blimps flying around your skies, but <laughs> whatever. Yeah, I don't like blimps. <laughs> For those that don't know. So yeah, educational blimps, it's alright. Not the worst policy ever. We'll now move on to recycling plastic, which forces recycling centres to work with 20% more efficiency at a cost of $10 per recycling centre per week. Uh, so if we fly over and find a recycling centre somewhere in Palavan, we should have one. Uh, somewhere around here. I know where there's one. There's one over here, isn't there? Um, so this will refer uh, to their processing rate. So if we turn this policy on. Again, if you want to apply this to a specific district with a lot of uh, recycled plastics in, it will reduce your garbage accumulation because they're working faster. Uh, so if we take a look at the numbers without the policy, it's... Processing at 24,000 units a week with uh, 15 garbage trucks. Again, these numbers will be different depending on uh, your garbage budget here. Uh, this will increase, of course, and decrease depending on if you slide it up and down. And then we'll pop this on. Let's go for recycling plastic. Leave the game on 3 speed for a hot second. We'll see our processing rate will jump up by, what was it, was it 20%? Yeah, with 20% more efficiency. So, if you've got a ton of recycling centres in your city... Um, that budget will jump up. You know, if you've got 10 recycling centers, that's an extra thousand dollars a week, um, which is fairly expensive. So it's up to you. I would probably just apply it to a district that you may be planning to put in a special uh, garbage processing building and then put your recycling centers there unless you want it applied citywide. It's really up to you, but you can just see how it kind of affects the numbers uh, when it's applied, it boosts up our processing rate as well. It doesn't affect the garbage trucks in use. This is controlled by your budget, um, but it will affect uh, the processing rate. So it's up to you. Not the worst policy ever, and it can help uh, reduce garbage accumulation in your city too. Uh, also quite useful if you're going for a very green themed city, then uh, recycled plastics is always nice. So the next policy is preferred parks and very similar to recycled plastics. It's going to draw 10% more visitors to all parks, plazas and park areas. So that's including these assets within these tabs. So all of these park assets alongside your park life areas. And um, it's referring to both here. Uh, so you will draw 10% more visitors, which is nice. If you have park life cheeses, then you'll make more money through the park life cheese. Um, however, it's also going to cost at $10 uh, per park, plaza and park area. This is something you want to apply uh, to a specific district with a lot of parks in it, um, such as the Hillside Gardens and Lavendervan here. Um, there's a lot of parks in this area. Uh, there's some over uh, down by the canals, and we've got a nice big one over by our metro station. Once cities get to a decent size, chances are you're going to have an absolute ton of park areas. Um, if you so if you apply it citywide, a cost of a hundred per park plaza and park area, this can get ridiculously expensive. Um, you imagine for those that have followed Palavan uh, all the way through, there's a ton of parks in this city, so <laughs> it would uh, it would bankrupt you pretty quickly. Um, so this is definitely something you want to apply to a district rather than citywide. But, you know, it's going to draw 10% more visitors, which in turn um, will make us more money uh, via these stats here. Um, of course, the vanilla parks, um, these don't make money. Uh, you know, you don't charge to get in them. So you will only make money through your park life areas with amusement parks, zoos, city parks and nature reserves. 
So just bear that in mind. Um, it's a good policy. More people coming to parks is always good for our cities. But it's an expensive one, so just be careful with it. Next up, we have the park maintenance boost, um, which increases the park maintenance vehicle's shift length by 50% at a cost of 80 per park maintenance service building. Now, what these park maintenance service buildings do is they will travel around the city. You see there are these little blue cars here. Look like they have a little canoe on the roof. These are them. They will travel around the city uh, and boost uh, the parks, uh, increasing their entertainment value and radius, uh, which will, of course, uh, the entertainment value will draw more people. And um, so that will tie really nicely into our previous policy we covered of prefer parks. And increasing their entertainment will also uh, boost land by it as well. Um, so, you know, they'll stay out for longer, continuing to do that job by 50% at a cost of 80 per park maintenance service building. 80 eight is nothing, <laughs> to, to be fair, um, per park service building. You'll tend to have quite a few of these in your city. They're only 147 a week. And uh, they're also really nice decoration assets as well. A little bit of appreciation here for how we used it alongside our tram depot. And um, to make a little bit of public transport detailing. Uh, in this part of Palavan. So a decent policy to have active. Again, city-wide. There's no reason not to have this active city-wide. 80 is fine. You know, you can afford 80. Um, and it's going to help increase your parks as well. We'll now move on to free Wi-Fi. Uh, which reduces the mail accumulation by 15%. Because people are sending email as opposed to traditional post. At a cost of $2 uh, per building in the city. Um, so very similar to the first policies we covered of power usage, you know, this scales per building in the city. So the bigger your city is, the more expensive this policy becomes. The reduced mail accumulation. Again, in my experience, the mail mechanic that was added with the industries DLC. It's not massively fleshed out. It's kind of like health. Um, you know, post is fine. I've never, I don't know. Maybe this is just the way I play my cities, but I've never really had any experience with posts um, causing any issues. We do have post sorting facilities. These things tend to produce a ton of traffic. Um, so I guess you can you know, apply this citywide. You know, if we go for, you know, we have 6,000 unsorted mail out of a capacity of 50,000. This is without the policy active. So, you know, if we were going to pop this on citywide and leave the game on three speed for a hot minute, you know, you can see that there's a prime example. Having free Wi-Fi on has dropped our unsorted mail down to nothing. So if you're finding your post-sorting facilities um, are just absolutely heaving with trucks, uh, then throw on free Wi-Fi. But again, this scales per building. So the bigger your city, the more expensive it's going to be. But not a bad policy, but I find the mail industry to be not massively fleshed out as it is. So, I don't know, let me know what you've kind of thought of the mail mechanic in cities. Next up, we have another post-service building policy, which is automated sorting, which will increase mail capacity by 10% at a cost of 300 per city post-service building. So if we pop this on, we currently have 500,000 either side. Let's go ahead and throw this on for automated sorting. It's going to increase by 10%, so we're now at 550,000 of unsorted and sorted mail. And that's going to cost you 300 per building. So again, similar to free Wi-Fi, post isn't the, the greatest thing ever. Um, if we come into our public transport, we can see, you know, you, you don't make any income from post. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it just is, is what it is. For me, the post offices are nice decorations and they work as nice corner assets. That's about the extent I get out of them. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe um, you guys have had a better experience with post than I have, but you know, if, if these places are really struggling and they're jam-packed, automated sorting will give you that extra 10% buffer. So if you want to put it on, you can do. Next up is for-profit education. Um, which all education facilities in the city become for profit and students are required to pay tuition fees to attend school. So this applies to all education buildings in the city. So if we leave this policy off, sorry for a second. See our dormitories currently cost 120 a week. 
Our Police Academy costs 960. Study Hall, 160. Now, this doesn't affect Varsity Sports. We check it. We have 3,000 a week up for our Aquatic Centre. Uh, I'm mentioning that because the Varsity Sports buildings are under the Education tab. It does not affect the Sports buildings. Uh, we come in and pop this policy on. We'll see these drop to 64. This becomes free. This drops to 80. But the Aquatic Centre stays at 300. Uh, this is a trade-off for citizen happiness. Um, so if you want to make a lot more money um, out of your university and school areas, then for-profit education is good. But again, it's trading off for citizen happiness. Again, if we just pop on our happiness overlay, a lot of the policies that we've activated that trade off for happiness, they have very tiny increases. A lot of the time, alongside parks and unique buildings, they really offset these kind of anti-happiness policies so it's not something you really have to worry about and we can also see here that they um they affect schools as well so currently the institute of creative arts is 288 a week and then we can take this off and come back in and then it'll pop back up to 576 so if you can afford to take the hit to your citizen happiness unless your sims are absolutely miserable then it's a nice way uh, to get some uh, money by charging for education within the city. Next up is book fair, which causes the local public libraries to organise a book fair, which will increase uh, happiness and entertainment within the public library's radius. So you're essentially giving your library buildings a buff, which is always nice. However, it will cost you a upkeep increase of 100% for all public libraries. So if we have a little look at our public library building here, um, this one right here, so you can see they have, um, they have a fairly wide radius. The one here in Park Park Town basically covers the entire town. Um, it currently costs 320 a week. If we pop this on, it goes up to 640. So it will double, you know, 100% increase. So if you're really desperate for a happiness and entertainment boost um, within a specific area, this might be something you want to apply to a specific district like just the Park Park Town. Um, rather than the entire city because obviously the more public libraries you have the more expensive this policy will become but if you want to give your libraries a buff apply the book fair policy next up we have fishing license which increases all residential tax income by five percent uh, which is nice that's a you know obviously this will scale with your cities as well so the bigger your cities are the more residentials you have the more money this will bring you in However, you are trading off for reduced citizen happiness and an increase in your crime by 5%. Of course, this can be offset by other policies we've looked at today, like longer prison sentences, and which is a free one to apply. Um, again, again, citizen happiness, for all the ones we've looked at today, you know, we can apply this. We'll pop fishing license on. We can see the happiness stats no one really cares <laughs> to be totally honest um you know this is maybe this is um i'll say it went up it went up <laughs> with this policy on well i don't know you know maybe people have uh different experiences i suppose every city is different right so it might behave differently in different cities um we know residential tax income um is one of your biggest earners in palavan it is the biggest earner uh, three hundred thousand. um with the uh, fishing license off if we put this on and have a look at it again you'll see you know this figure will just slowly crawl up uh, by a total of five percent obviously residents come and go all the time so this figure will never be stable and um, it will constantly scale with your population but a five percent increase to what is i'm going to assume everyone's biggest earner is always residential tax income 5% increase for basically no happiness decrease, even though it says it, um, and increase by 5. This is a good one to have on citywide. Um, I wouldn't see a reason not to use this. But again, everyone's experience may differ, so let me know in the comments if you have had a different experience with it. Next up, we have the tourist travel card, um, which the city offers affordable intercity bus tickets to people living in the surrounding cities to increase tourism. And um, this will bring you 8% more tourists, which is always nice. Tourists visit unique buildings, go to parks, 
usual public transport, you know, they, they bring money into your city, so an, an 8% increase isn't something to ignore. However, you will also uh, increase your intercity bus network and upkeep by 15%. So if we have a look at one of our intercity bus stations here, it's currently costing us 800 a week. If we bring this up, it's going to increase to 1,012. So this will apply to all of your intercity bus stations. So of course it will scale to become fairly expensive the more intercity bus assets you've got in your city. But you're bringing in 8% more tourists, which is nice. So again, there's no real reason not to have this active citywide. 8% more tourists is always nice. And 15%, it's not that bad. Uh, definitely a mid to late game policy. I wouldn't apply this early on um, because you will eat into your budget. So we now have probably what is the weirdest policy in the game, which is Argy-based water filtering. Um, this increases the filtering in water intakes and purification level in drain pipes by 45%. And it also reduces the algae farm production by 50% and increases your water facility upkeep by 15%. Really random policy. <laughs> um, I would definitely say that the trade-offs here... If you're relying on your fishing areas using algae farms, which I never use the algae stuff, I'd rather see the boats moving around than the algae stuff. Um, then, you know, be prepared to take that 50% hit. And then an increase to your water facility upkeep by 15%. Again, the bigger your city, the, the bigger that 15% is going to be. And, you know, if we have a look at Palavan, how much are we spending on water stuff? Let's go into our budget and go to uh, this one here. There's 25,000. So if we, we throw this policy on, you know, this is going to jump up by 15% for better water filtering with the purification level in drave pipes by 45%. For me, this, this is totally useless. <laughs> A really gimmicky policy. So we'll now move on to our second tab of taxation. Again, in my own experience, I've never really had any great success with these. If I'm messing about with taxes, I'm doing it manually in my taxes tab. Everything's at 12% and it's always been fine, <laughs> you know. Um, anything less than this, you're not making the maximum amount of income. Anything more, you're going to start getting people complaining. So it's interesting to note that these policies, they don't override your tax rate set in the taxes tab so even though we apply the tax raise for low residential by two percent it does not reflect within our taxes tab so again this is probably best applied um to a specific district if we come into the emerald district winter policies and then set a tax raise for this if you want to make a little more money out of your low uh, density residential areas in one specific place then you can do that. I, I never really dabble with these. And then it's the same uh, for all of our relevant zonings. So low density residential, low and high commercial, office zonings. And then it's the opposite for these next ones. It's tax relief. It drops it by 2% instead of increasing it. So again, I, I've never really found um, a theme when this has been useful. So you see now that we have applied the tax raise for low density residential. Everyone's whinging about taxes are too high. So then what you would do is, is you come in and then drop this by 2% to offset that increase. Everyone stops complaining. Really pointless applying this. <laughs> it's, um, you know, I don't know. I've, I haven't had any success with these. If I want to mess with my tax rates, I do it manually in the taxes tab. Um, and just bring everything into 12%, which is the golden number. Um, any higher, you get people whinging. Any lower, you're not making the most amount of income. Now, the last option within this uh, tab of taxation is let go of leisure, which causes leisure specialised areas to stop generating all tax income, but they will get a hefty boost in the entertainment and attractiveness values, um, which, of course, means they draw more people. Um, so unless you're making an absolute ton of money and all of your commercial within your city is leisure... Um, you know, you will lose an absolute ton of commercial income. Um, you know, you can actually hover over it and get a tool tip. So I make 7,566 out of, out of leisure areas. 
which is not bad. That's like what the the third biggest figure. If we apply this, we're going to get let go of leisure. Come back into our economy tab, hover over commercial. And then you'll see that leisure will fall to zero because we now have the policy active where leisure specialized areas don't pay any tax income. But they're going to draw more people, which means more people will visit your part life areas, which means they'll pay the usual public transport systems to get here. So again, it's going to be very city dependent and you know everyone's going to be different. Just double check how much money you're making from leisure first and by hovering over your little eye icon on the commercial tab and you'll see the little theater mask face that's going to indicate how much money you're making from leisure. So again, it's all, it's all right. It's going to you know bring more people to the area, but it's only really worth applying if they're going to get to the area with, with public transport and pay to use that public transport and then also visit the part life areas uh, within the city, uh, within the leisure areas as well. Uh, so Dawson Waterfront, for an example, um, there's no part life areas here. You know, we're using park assets, but, you know, people aren't paying to enter these uh, green belts. They're all just kind of open decorative space. So, again, you've got to make a judgment call on it. Um, I've never really had it active. I've never really had a cause to get more people to come visit the leisure area. And, you know, 7,000 a week isn't something to ignore with uh, commercial income. So, it's a decent policy. Certainly not essential though. We'll now move on to the city planning options available in the city. And first up are small business enthusiast and big business benefactor, which affects low density and high density commercial respectively. And um, these two will increase their sales, which means they sell more goods. Um, however, you need to bear in mind if you don't have the industry space available to produce these goods, because obviously our industrial areas feed our commercial areas with you know goods to sell. And um, then, you know, you can be, if you put this on, um, you'll start to see those warning signs. I think it's like uh, not enough buyers for products and then um, maybe too much goods to sell. I can't remember the exact warnings. I'll throw them up on the screen now. Um, but if you're going to have these on, they also partner really nicely with industrial space planning, which is the next option. So this allows zoned industry. So that's not uh, industries DLC areas. Uh, they would double the amount of goods they produced uh, by zoned industry buildings which of course ties in with the commercial areas doubling their sales so if you're going to have either of these on it's usually a good idea to partner it with industrial space plan as well they kind of go hand in hand um, to increase the sales of all your uh, commercial goods and um, but you know they do have an upkeep cost of uh, two dollars four dollars and then six dollars respectively so the more types of zonings you have of each of these, the more expensive these three policies become. So just bear that in mind if you're going to use them. So the next option here is high-tech housing, which turns homes into much cooler smart homes to raise the land value around them, which of course will slightly increase the land value. And then also it costs a upkeep of $4 per residential building. Again, if you want to apply this, you, you can do. It's... It's a trade-off for slightly increased land value for an upkeep cost of a building. Um, you can apply it to a specific district if you want, um, or city-wide. But again, you know, it's one of these policies that scales. So, you know, if you want to do it, you can do. So I've just applied it to Hickory Square here. Um, it does change the aesthetic appearance of the houses. You can see now I've applied it, they're starting to level up and grow. So if you're after a specific vibe... Yeah, you know they do they do change them into much cooler looking modern smart houses so if you're going for a specific vibe or a build and you don't want these kind of real modern looking ones within the area then don't apply it if you do and you want the land value increase go ahead and apply high-tech housing there's no reason not to but you will be paying that extra upkeep per residential building as well Next up is high rise ban and this is a really useful policy from stopping your skyscrapers going too tall and this is a really useful policy and especially if you're going for a real key aesthetic on your build and if we wanted to apply this to Carnalvan uh, for example we can come in and apply its high rise ban and then you'll see our high rises will slowly disappear so these are all level 5 so you see they just 
disappear on their own. Goodbye houses. Uh, they will regrow, and then what it does is um, it just prohibits the construction of tall buildings, and it will restrict the buildings from reaching their highest level. So you have to bear in mind that higher level buildings pay more tax income. So if you're going to apply this, you're keeping your skyline. Oh dear, <laughs> enormous fire in the background. Ignore that. That's fine. Parliament's finished now. Um, so you know you're not going to get the maximum amount of tax income, but you're trading off to keep your skyline nice and trimmed, at a, like a literal height cap. So if this is active citywide, then you're not going to get any skyscrapers anywhere. So certainly a policy you want to apply uh, to a specific district, and then it's going to keep these buildings leveled off at a nice sensible height rather than allowing them to grow enormously tall. Next up, we have the heavy traffic ban, um, which will ban... Uh, heavy traffic vehicles however it does also say to make sure that there are optional routes available because if a business in the area needs services and deliveries then the truck will still pass through the area despite the ban being active uh, this refers to the kind of articulated trucks like these guys here the oil trucks and the farm ones as well if we can find one zooming around here and um, it won't refer to vans or anything it's like you know, articulated lorries and tractors, you know, big vehicles uh, that this will affect. And um, of course, these uh, vehicles produce more noise pollution. So if you don't want, say, for example, our our country town over here, Dawson, and um, if I didn't want uh, big heavy trucks passing through the town centre and wanted to force them to go around the outside road, then we can do that. Let's have a little test. Let's just trim up uh, the district so it doesn't accompany these roads over here. Take these ones off, and then if I was to apply uh, this specific policy over to uh, Dawson, um, which actually already has it on, we now won't see any articulated trucks or tractors pass through Dawson, and we will still get vans, which we just saw one drive past there. We see there's one, there's one here. So this doesn't count as a heavy vehicle. Um, it is just kind of you know, real heavy um, industrial vehicles that won't pass through Dawson. Um, so make sure they have an alternate route available because if they don't, they will still pass through the area. Uh, so that's something to bear in mind um, if you want to apply this policy. Uh, of course, it doesn't apply to garbage trucks because they need to get into the area to collect garbage. So again, not massively useful. Um, if you don't want real heavy industrial traffic passing through an area, apply heavy traffic ban. Uh, but you know, just make sure they've got an alternate route available, otherwise they will still pass through it anyway. Next up in our city planning options is encourage biking. So when this policy is active, most citizens will prefer bicycles over motor vehicles. This is a policy, it doesn't cost us anything, and um, cycling's really good. People will cycle further than they can walk, so it keeps private vehicles off the road, which is always nice, it's going to reduce traffic. And plus it's going to make your cycle highways a lot busier around the city as well. Uh, even though there's no traffic stats within public transport, which is where we would expect it to fall, we can actually come to our menu, go to city stats, and then there's an option here just to tick cyclists, and you can kind of see, um, you know, how many people have been cycling um, you know, per thousand over how many years. And you can see where I've turned off uh, Encourage Biking for the sake of this video, and it's just been an enormous drop. So... You know, you can kind of see there, you know, as the population grows over the number of years, more people are cycling. When I turn off the policy for this video, it nosedived. And so what we'll do is we'll set up a time lapse of Palavin's um, busy cycle network somewhere in the city. I'll go find a spot for it. And then we'll have a, a visual representation of exactly how many more people uh, cycle with and without this policy active.
So you can see from our little time lapses that there is visually more people cycling and also taking more directions across your cycle networks as well. Of course, you will get more mileage out of this depending on the extent of your cycle networks. And one more time, just checking our city stats as well, we can see where I turned off the policy for the sake of this video. There was an enormous drop. So all of this data here, as the population grows, more people are cycling. So up until this point here, Encourage Biking was on, turned it off, enormous nosedive. So Encourage Biking, great policy to have on, and you should have it on citywide. There's no reason not to. And then coming back into cycling, we have banned bikes on sidewalks, which this policy bans cycling on sidewalks. Bikes can only use dedicated bike lanes on the roads and bike pathways, including these ones here. I kind of find this counterproductive. Um, there's no reasons not to have cyclists on on the sidewalks if they can, you know, if they, if they, if they can cycle, why would you stop them? Um, it just means you have to be a lot more precise with your bike infrastructure to get them to use the bike lanes and bike pathways. Um, but fairly useless for me. I never use band bikes and sidewalks. And next up, we now have NIMBY, which is <laughs> a strange name. Uh, no loud noise at night. Um, leisure specialised areas will close for the night, reducing noise pollution caused by leisure. Um, so for those that don't know, leisure specialisations, they don't close at night time. So this is only really a policy that you will notice if you actively play with the day-night cycle on all the time and factor in all the changes that come with the night time, such as the budget stuff, um, and like the noise pollution caused by leisure. It's never a good idea to zone residential near leisure specialisation anyway, or high-density commercial and sometimes low-density commercial in large amounts as well. So fairly pointless, you're only going to lose tax income throughout the night time with the leisure not being open, so NIMBY might as well just not exist. I've never used it and I don't really see a reason why you would. So next up is the Old Town Policy, which is essentially uh, the residential and commercial version of the heavy traffic ban. And so applying this to a district, you definitely don't want to apply this citywide, this has to be on a district really. Um, you can really cripple your city if you apply this citywide. Um, only residences and businesses can use the area for motor vehicles and bans all other motor traffic. Uh, this is really good for forcing people to take public transport. Um, if you want them to get to an area and they can't take their private car, then they have to take a bus or a train or a metro. Um, yeah, and it essentially gives it the old town vibe. Not a traditional old town where you think, you know, it would ban all vehicles and all the streets would become pedestrianised, as you would find a lot in Europe. Um, but certainly a useful policy. Uh, it's not something I really use, but it is a cool policy, um, just because of the way I play the game. Uh, but Old Town is decent, uh, very much a themed uh, policy for getting an area to look and function the way that you want it to. We are now coming into the realm of totally useless policies, starting with lightning rods. So this requests the tallest buildings to install lightning rods on their roofs to lower the likelihood of them catching fire during a thunderstorm. Um, so these are the natural disasters policies, uh, unless you're playing actively in your gameplay settings with natural disasters on, these are pointless and will just eat into your budget. Um, I haven't really played at all with natural disasters active in the area, so can't speak too much to them. If you don't want your buildings to burn down, why are you playing with natural disasters on? <laughs> I don't know. It's not for me, but that's what Lightning Rods does. And with VIP area, any and all shelters in the policy area are reserved only for citizens living in the policy area. So if you only want your citizens to go to the shelters, um, so they don't get blown up again, how much of a difference does this really make? Can't speak to it. I'm not a natural disasters lover. A fast recovery. Uh, in these areas, the emergency response unit does not search for survivors, but only makes the lot ready for rebuilding. So more citizens are lost, but the city recovers faster. So again, if you want your city to grow faster after watching a meteorite slam into it and not have as many survivors recover, use fast recovery. Uh, no rebuilding, uh, forbid rebuilding on lots with destroyed buildings. Uh, lots have to be manually bulldozed to real our building. So if you want to go around and manually bulldoze a lot of destroyed buildings, use no <laughs> use no rebuilding natural disaster policies aren't great and 
again, they kind of fall under the gimmicky uh, policy options for me. So the next policy is combustion engine ban. So only electric cars are allowed in the affected area, except for residences, businesses, and city service vehicles. Um, so this also says, please note this policy takes some time to have an effect. And citizens with combustion engine vehicles will avoid the policy area, but if they have a destination within the area, they will travel to it. So, kind of seems counterproductive <laughs> for a, a combustion engine ban. And then likewise, the opposite to this one is the electric cars, with everyone living in the policy area must switch to an electric cars if they own vehicles at a cost of $2 um, per vehicle per week. Since there's no air pollution stat within the game, um, these kind of seem a little bit redundant, but okay. There is something worth noting that with electric cars policy, uh, for those that follow my series, uh, you know that we use uh, the Green Cities Edison Hypercharger uh, car parks a lot for detailing, especially outside of larger assets like stadiums and stuff where you would expect to find car parks. These won't be used unless this policy is active somewhere. And um, if you apply it on a district, then people from that district will come and use these car parks. If you apply it citywide, it's a cost of $2 per vehicle. Again, this scales with the size of your city. The more cars in the city, the more expensive this this policy will become. Um, but as this policy is now active citywide, uh, we will now start seeing people uh, using the Edison Hyperchargers. Uh, because of course, whilst they are car park assets, the game is reading them as, you know, electric car charging points. Um, so you can see now with the policy off, they're not coming in. Um, but once the game picks up on this policy being active um, for electric cars, uh, we will start seeing some uh, cars actually park within the lots now here as well. Uh, we can probably go and find some car parks somewhere in the city with these on. Uh, these are the four by two car parks. So you see where... Um, where it has the regular car parking space, cars are using them, but all the electric ones are empty. So this is because electric cars was off, but now we have it on, and um, you will start to see uh, some people come in. So apart from people actually using um, your uh, car parks, next up is filter industrial waste, which causes zoned industrial buildings to filter their waste, making them pollute the ground a lot less. Uh, which will cost you two dollars per zoned industrial building every week so having this active will just bring your ground pollution down and um, there's currently basically little to no pollution um, in palavan so it's a useless policy for me but if you find that your zoned industrial areas are making lots of pollution and you hate that horrible brownish purple taint that it leaves on the ground filter industrial waste can help with that Next up is boost connections, which will increase the traffic capacity um, outside of the city by 20%. So this will apply to uh, your ferry ports, uh, your airports, external train lines and motorways. So we'll kind of run over each of them here. So if we put it on, this does cost 10,000 a week, which is insanely expensive for a policy. Uh, but you know, you're going to be getting more people into your city. Um, so, you know, I'm paying 10,000 a week for this policy to be active. But in return, I'm getting 20% more people arrive by the airport who are going to spend money in the city. They're also going to use my public transport and visit my park life cheeses. Uh, you're going to get more people coming through the roads, which means more people coming through uh, toll booths if we fly over here. And, um, you know, there's going to be 20% more cars passing through these. And then likewise, um, over at Gralavan, you know, there's going to be 20% more sims arriving uh, via this uh, train switch point, which means there's 20% more people passing through Fromage Park, which is one of our best and most efficient park life cheeses here, uh, with people crossing the highway. So it's a very much a late game policy. Um, applying this early will absolutely murder your economy. Um, so you know a 20% increase is good. That's a it's one fifth of what you're already bringing in. But you just want to make sure you have the infrastructure such as part life cheeses, public transport and toll booths in order to justify that cost. Because 10,000 is a lot. But, you know, if you want more people in the city, then use boost connections. Next up, we have a workers union policy, which is, again seems to be uh, another pointless happiness trade-off. 
um, which is going to reduce your residential tax income by 2% um, for a slightly increased happiness. So again, if you if you put this on, you can apply it to a district if you want. Um, you know, it provides the workers with better benefits, increases their morale, but reduces the tax income. You can put it on, you can check your citizen happiness. There's little to no change um, with this. I find, I don't know, again, this could just be my experience with the game, but a lot of the happiness policies, unless combined and stacked on top of each other relentlessly, but you're usually losing money um, as a result of that, they're, yeah, fairly useless. I wouldn't really bother with Workers Union. And next up is Automated Tolls, um, which is a fairly decent one. Increases the vehicle throw through toll booths so they don't have to stop. Um, but it also reduces toll booth income uh, by 20%. So when would you use this? Um, there's no need to use it here because these toll booths aren't backing up. They're not busy. Um, you know They can afford to slow down and pay the toll themselves and you know, traffic continues to flow. Uh, an example where I have used this is over um, by the enormous four-way interchange that Imperator built for us. Um, we do have a policy here. And we can see the automated toll is active. That's because we have two toll booths here. So you can see they don't slow down and pay the toll. Just some stupid traffic AI lane change in here. Um, so they can continually flow because if we take um, automated toll off of this district, we will watch the people slow down and pay the toll, um, which is already backing the traffic up onto the bridge. Uh, and since this is an insanely busy intersection, and um, you know it's kind of like right in the heart of Palavan, transfers people back into from Eurovan into the downtown and um, down into the cargo port over here. Uh, so super busy interchange. Uh, this is a great example of when automated tolls comes in useful. You do reduce your income by 30%, but you increase your traffic as a result. So automated tolls, it has its place, not something you want citywide really on extremely busy road networks. Next up, we have Industry 4.0, which the new technologies alter the nature of the industrial workforce. Now this affects all industrial workplaces are for well and highly educated citizens and increased production output by 50%. However, it also reduces the workplace by 30%. So that's workplace numbers, the amount of jobs available uh, for zoned industry. So again, this is a, uh, specifically for zoned industry. Um, so again, you have to bear in mind that your uh, employment rates will take a hit here because you're excluding uh, low educated people from working in those industrial areas. But you know, you're also increasing your output by 50% as well. Uh, and this would tie in uh, really nicely with uh, industrial space planning because you're doubling the amount of um, goods you can output, so you're essentially getting 150% increase in your industrial production with these two policies active. So again, you know, it's a balance between everyone's city, and um, if you want to exclude all low-educated sims from working in the industrial areas, which is usually where they go to work in the, um, the lower-level uh, zoned industry stuff, um, and you're going to reduce your workplaces as well, which means you need to zone more of it in order to get people to stay in jobs. But also ties in nicely with some of the education policies that we've looked at today as well. If we come back to services and then do education boost, you know, you're going to prioritize education over working, which means that when they are educated, they're going to come into uh, these well-educated jobs. So you can kind of see how a few of these policies help tie into each other and complement the other. Um, it's never something I've used. However, I nearly almost always use the industry's DLC stuff to satisfy my industrial demand. Um, I never use, the only time I really use um, zoned industrial um, is for decoration, like over here, the stuff that was burning down earlier. Um, no, this is the only time I use it, these little one by one squares and stuff around old dead rails and kind of like the old rail watchtowers and old abandoned factories. So it depends how you're using zoned industry, um, but if you are, do you have a lot of zoned industry in your city? this will quite severely affect it, so just be careful if you are going to turn it on. Next up we have sustainable fishing, um, which decreases the yields by 10% and increases the uh, hub upkeep by 15%. It also increases citizen happiness by 15% and commercial income from goods by 5%. 
So this is quite good. Um, fishing as an industry is by no means the best money maker in the game. Um, oil and ore are probably the best ways to make money from industry. So taking a 10% less yield from your fishing isn't that bad. And the assets aren't really that expensive anyway. Um, it's only 166 for these ones and you know the, the fish factory is 400. Fish market is 192. They're not the most expensive assets to run. Um, so to take a 15% increase in citizen happiness is is pretty good. Um, you know, this is for the first time in this video uh, where we've seen a decent, substantial increase in citizen happiness by 15%. Um, and we're also going to get income from uh, commercial income from goods by 5% as well. So, you know, you're trading off decreased yield and high upkeep for one of the less efficient industries for increased happiness and more money from commercial goods so sustainable fishing is decent um, you probably apply it citywide unless you just want to apply it maybe to a specific um district you can see that we have it active on the uh the palavan river fish co-op uh, already so you know it's decent it's a it's not a bad little policy uh, but you just want to make sure that your economy can you know, unless your economy is totally reliant on fishing, you might struggle with sustainable fishing policy, but otherwise, you're all right with it. Again, another happy fish policy. Um, dolphin safe fishing will decrease the fish yield by 25% and increase citizen happiness by 25%. So, you know, having both of these policies on, and um, we're going to decrease our yield by a total of 35% um, for an increase of happiness of 35% as well. Um, so if you're struggling with happiness and you love dolphins, dolphin safe fishing is great. Um, but again, you know, just be careful that your your budget and economy isn't entirely reliant on the fishing industry, um, because you're going to be taking a less than thirty five percent yield here, uh, which will also affect how well your fish factory and fish market assets remain stocked as well, because you won't be catching as many fish. And then last but not least, we have a unique building specific policy for airplane tours. So the local aviation club starts organizing airplane tours, which will increase the plane count, entertainment and sitting attractiveness, but also increases the building uh, noise pollution um, by 50%, which is 50% is a big increase for noise pollution. Um, but, you know, you don't really have these things near residentials anyway. So it's something you have in your city, uh, the Aviation Club from Sunset Harbour. Then uh, just be careful that you're not gonna that that noise pollution increase um, isn't gonna affect any nearby houses. But um, you know you're gonna get more planes going around and increases the entertainment and city attractiveness, which is always good things to have. Uh, it's gonna mean more tourists and ultimately more money. Okay, guys, that is gonna do it for today. I want to thank you all so much for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, likes, comments and shares below are always massively appreciated and they really do help the channel. Equally as much if you haven't enjoyed it, please feel free to leave a dislike as well. And apologies if I have got anything wrong today, I am basing this video entirely off my own experience with the policies. Um, some of them I'm really familiar with, other ones like a lot of the fish and stuff and natural disasters I very rarely use. Um, City Skylines, I mentioned today, you kind of reach... You reach a point of critical mass where nothing can stop you and you know once your city reaches a certain size any kind of issues in the city you can basically just turn your back on and carry on playing unless you're quite anal about that kind of stuff then it doesn't really matter but either way i hope maybe you've learned something today and again i've mentioned today uh if you have had any different experiences with the policies uh, in your cities and maybe you want to share something with me and the other viewers please throw it down in the comments below. Uh, maybe I've missed something, or perhaps misinterpreted something as well. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. If you would like to come and see uh, the city that we've been flying around today, if you haven't seen this before, this is Palavan, um, our City Skylines vanilla build. Um, it is finished now. I will leave um, links up throughout the video and down in the description below to the playlist. One of my favourite cities, absolutely beautiful. <laughs> so uh, if you want to come and watch this city be constructed over uh, 90 episodes and live streams, um, then there are links down there in the description to go and do that. Otherwise, we'll shut up and leave it there. Well, thank you all so much for watching. And as always, enjoy the rest of your day.